This is my intro music. Welcome to the video. I hope you like it lots, so don't forget to subscribe and click the thumbs up button. Now let's react. Hey, hi, hello there, and welcome to me putting together a video that isn't this video, but we're gonna use this video to put the other video together. Mainly, I wanted to talk about uh, Momo problems here. I am putting together a video, it might end up being a set of videos, talking about uh, fat activism, privilege, the commodification of obesity, and the elevating of the individual over the collective. So, postmodern feminists, uh, postmodern feminism. Do you want me to read? Applying Angela McRobbie's critique of post-feminism, post-feminist culture reveals how fat acceptance has become a market-driven movement that emphasizes individualism, commodification, and performative empowerment over systematic change. You know that thing they're always talking about, but they never do? Anyway, that's going to be part of the video. But what got this ball rolling is not that I didn't think fat acceptance was privileged, because it is. It's this woman's video here. It's the second one that's pinned. This is one here. Um, we're actually going to watch this one. We've already seen it on this channel, but I want to watch this one. And then I just kind of want to scroll through some of uh, Momo's problems, other video clips, because this one set everybody off like fireworks. It was beautiful. It was lovely. I enjoyed it a great deal. Watching fat acceptance fucking melt down because someone dared to point out to them that they have privilege if they're able to get to such a large size because they have access to more food than other people in the world, even in this country, the United States, that they could grow to such proportions, right? She's nicer about it than I am, but... I wanted to, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm doing this research anyway. I kind of want to watch this one. Let's watch this together. We'll react to some of her other stuff too. We're not going to watch the political ones though, because I just don't want to deal with politics. I just don't. Though there is a very strong argument that fat acceptance is political and any social movement is inherently political. So there is that, but we're not going to talk about left versus right stuff is what we're not going to do. All right. So if you've never seen this video before, this, this TikTok before, we're gonna, this is the raw format of it, right? And it oddly took me a lot to find this because nobody puts links in their descriptions anymore. So I'm gonna start putting links in my descriptions. This is Momo Problems. This is from August, September, August 12th. Um, being able to eat yourself into obesity takes a certain level of privilege. True facts. That's not a bad thing. True facts. It just is. Everyone has privilege in some way. True. And recognizing that can be a way to empower ourselves and gain perspective in our place in this world. Also true. I think that a lot of people in hashtag fat acceptance have forgotten to appreciate what they have and instead choose to complain and refuse personal accountability. And that's what set the world on fire. Uh, hashtag for you page, uh, fat liberation, fat liberation movement, fat acceptance movement, health at every size, health at every, health at any size, obesity, obesity is a disease. Weight loss, fat acceptance movement, fat acceptance community flaws. I didn't know that was a hashtag and fat privilege. Ooh, we might go through some of these hashtags. Thank you, Momo problems. Anyway, let's watch this with some sound. Yes, yes, you can do this, I promise. I have a hot take for you. If you are someone who is able to access enough food to be obese or morbidly obese, you have privilege. I know. I'm supposed to do this, aren't I? That's a tough concept to like understand, <laughs> but you have privilege, especially over people that can't even afford food, okay? If you have the ability to eat in excess of your like normal caloric intake to the point where you're able to maintain an extremely high body weight you have a lot of privilege to be able to do that compared to people that literally cannot eat 
I'm not saying this to be mean. I just think that it's important that we get a little perspective on where we're at and actually like how put down we are by society because I don't think a lot of people who are overweight like myself think about the fact that we have a lot of privilege to be able to even be overweight. That's not a bad thing. It just is. I'm not saying this to offend anyone. Oh, she's not done. My bad. Anyone? I'm just trying to give you a little bit of perspective. So, I hope this helps. Have a good day. You're supposed to end it with, have the, the day you deserve. Have the deserve you day. Welcome to my world. Weirdly, this video, I feel, probably took a lot of courage to post. A, the internet is a terrible place. It's just, it's always been a terrible place, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, so the chances of you getting a crap ton of backlash for putting any form of opinion on the internet is very high. Going after an incredibly vocal group of people, aka fat acceptance, on the internet using the platform that they love the most, which is TikTok, probably painted a huge target on this person. Um, I don't know this person personally, but when I made the first video about this, they did comment uh, on the video afterwards. So, you know, full disclosure, I have spoken with them via comments on a video and there that's it but i can only imagine like the level of vitriol and hate and just bullshit that this person had to put up with after she posted this video and i i can imagine how bad it was in the dms and in the comments i'm not even going to look at the comments on this because i don't hate myself that much um but just going off of the reactions that many well-known fat acceptance people on the TikTok had to her, none of them came up with anything that resembled an argument, by the way. All of them either re all of them either resorted to ad hominem attacks or they made what about statements which had nothing to do with anything she said they completely ignored everything she had to say other than the obesity equals privilege part or they came up with these like straw man arguments that again had nothing to do with what this video was about and not only had nothing to do with it but were terribly flawed straw man arguments like the shit they were saying and the evidence they were providing did not correlate at all. Where are these people going to school? Where are they learning how to argue? How do, are they not learning how to use evidence in an argument? What is wrong with our education system these days? Anyway, these are college graduates. These people are the future. <laughs> anyway um but just going off of the responses that she did receive and that i saw in video form i can only imagine what the dms looked like and what the comment section looks like and again i'm not going to look at the comment section because i don't hate myself that much um but i do want to say i think this was very brave and it's sad that i have to say this was brave because this is true right i have to say this person who is saying truthful things is brave because fat acceptance is such a community of bullies and hate and just nastiness they create hostility on the internet and they will come for you because they've got nothing else to do apparently it's sad that I have to say this is brave because the other side is so fucking terrible, right? And the other side, the fat acceptance side, will sit here and be like, oh, 
We're here for inclusivity. We're here for minority groups. We're here for marginalized people. We're here for the little guy. No, you're, you're performing white saviorism and it's gross. Stop it. Okay. Stop. Anyway. So I wanted to see some of her other stuff. This being one of them, actually. Do -do 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 -do. Um, let me pull up the, there we go. This is again, Momo's problems. This is again from August. Yeah, I have to do the numbers in my head. I wish I had trusted my doctors before I was in danger. Uh, and there are a crap ton of hashtags here. One of them being pregnant TikTok. Um, medical fat phobia kills. Uh, medical fat phobia. I want to see what she has to say about it. Because I get the feeling from her page that she is not necessarily um, anti-body positivity or even anti-fat acceptance. But I don't think she's, I think she's like what the movement is supposed to be. My Mormon ancestors said I needed to start the day with a soda. We might end up watching that one just because it's funny. All right, anyway, let's watch this one, the deconstructing fat acceptance, because we like to deconstruct fat acceptance here. Also, your bathroom wall is fun, and I appreciate it a great deal. I'm going to get extremely vulnerable for a moment and tell you a story about my health. Yay. I am someone who consumed fat acceptance and fat liberation content for a majority of my 20s. And it convinced me that I should not trust doctors to the point. This is a three minute video or almost four minute video. Um, problem with TikTok is I can't speed it, speed it up. She is still very young. I just, okay, she looks like she's still very young. So I'm glad that she managed to get out of, fact, out of fat acceptance at this age. And also, she doesn't look like she's, I mean, she says she's fat. I will take her, I, I will take her word on that, right? And the reason I'm saying, the reason I'm harping on that is because reversing the weight gain at that size, especially at her age, it's like... If you're gonna be fat, this is the opportune time to stop being fat because the health problems haven't caught up with you yet. Though, from the sounds of it, <laughs> that might not be true. But anyway, I'll let her finish. Well, no, I won't. I'll go until I have something else to say. The point where I did not go see a doctor, even when I was extremely ill, until I was 26 and pregnant with twins. I Girl props. I felt like I should go to the doctor at that point because I had a high-risk pregnancy, not only because I was having multiples, but also because I have multiple health conditions that cause someone to have a high-risk pregnancy. Interesting. And so at that time, I started going to the doctor, but I did not trust my doctor, so I was not honest with my doctor. And later in my pregnancy, I got diagnosed with gestational diabetes, which is common for women who are overweight and pregnant with multiples and i was both of those things my family the women in my family have always told me that it's common for us the women in my family to get gestational diabetes and i just always accepted that i was just like well if i get pregnant i'll end up with diabetes gestational diabetes which is not great by the way just because it's common does not mean it's good it's actually kind of bad it's very bad on the woman it's potentially dangerous for the fetus it's not something you want. I just assumed it was something that my family did because my family, right? No, it's because every freaking woman on that side of the family from my grandmother forward were overweight. I meant to turn this off too. There we go. Sorry about that. We were getting gestation or my family gets gestational diabetes because the women in my family are obese when they get pregnant. They're all high risk pregnancies. Every single one of them have been that way. From I don't know my grandmother, obviously. I wasn't around when she was pregnant. I'm gonna guess, judging by pictures, she probably didn't have that issue. But all of my aunts, my mother, my cousins, they've all had it. The only reason I haven't had it is because I don't have kids. It's 
it's scary when you think about that. Like I just accepted that that was a family trait. It's a family trait because my family's obese, right? And just the fact that some people are just like, well, that's just the way it is because that's how I was is kind of terrifying. They're testing the fire alarms in my apartments and our fire alarms are so loud. They are two buildings down from me and I can still hear the damn thing going off. That's how loud the fire alarms are in my apartment buildings. They are ridiculously loud. They are like, I'm positive I have hearing damage because of the fire alarms. And my cats have been hidden for the last half hour because that's when they tested the, the alarms in this building. I'm pretty sure my cats now have hearing damage thanks to these fucking fire alarms. Anyway, not mad. I was set up with a nutritionist and a dietitian mm -hmm. by my doctor. And I lied to them. I lied to them about the kinds of food I was eating. I lied to them about how much I was eating. I lied to them about my insulin levels. I lied to them about everything because I didn't want them to know that I was not being healthy because I was afraid that they would discriminate against me and they would not provide me with the health care that I needed. Now. Okay, spoilers. If you're presenting to the doctor and you're clearly an at-risk pregnancy, and you're also clearly overweight and or obese. I don't know how big she is for reals. Um, they, they know. <laughs> they know you're not eating healthy. And if you're telling them, oh, I only eat salads and, and lean meat, they know that you're lying. Okay? I don't know why people think doctors are stupid. They're not. And if a doctor is jaded, it's probably either because A, they, you know, they're just that kind of a doctor. Or B, they've had so many people lie to them at this point. I mean, look at doctor now. How many of those people come into his office and are just like, I don't know why I'm damn near 700 pounds, doctor. All I eat is air and water. It, they're not dumb. Doctors aren't stupid. Anyway. If I had just been honest with them, they probably would have caught the severe preeclampsia that I had developed that was causing my organs to fail. Oh shit. I had to have an emergency C-section at 32 weeks because I was dying due to complications caused by my gestational diabetes. Okay, remember when I said gestational diabetes suck is bad? I didn't know it could kill you. I knew it could kill the fetuses. I didn't know it could take the mom out too. My cats are so traumatized when they hear the alarm from the other two building, from the building all the way down there, they run and hide. It's not audible. You guys won't be able to hear it anymore. But that's how traumatized that fire alarm has made my animals, is that they are trying to hide when they hear the other buildings going off. Anyway. Which I was not managing properly because I was lying about the kind of food I was consuming and my insulin. For those of you listening at home, she has a little hashtag that says blood sugar levels because for whatever reason she was saying insulin levels and she meant blood sugar levels. I just want to clarify that for people who are just listening. I know this now. I know that maybe there couldn't have been anything that I could have done to prevent myself from getting gestational diabetes or severe preeclampsia. However, I do know that I did not do everything necessary to prevent that from happening. And I take okay. Actually, that is an excellent point. I think that's something, I don't think I've heard anybody else put it that way. So props, Momo. She said, I know there's nothing, I know I could not have, what did she say? No, let me back it up. Cause she put that really well. Oh, no, no. What did she say? Go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. Come forward. She says, maybe there couldn't have been anything that I could have done to prevent myself from getting gestational diabetes or severe preeclampsia. However, I know that I did not do everything necessary to prevent that from happening. 
When people do that whole, oh, skinny people get yada, yada, yada. Yeah, you're right. There is a chance that I could get any number of ailments, right? Just randomly. I could just develop cancer. But we have, we the human species, have a certain level of health and medical awareness at this point that we know that certain things that we do to ourselves or that we participate in or that activities that we do raise the risk level of various uh, ailments and whatnot. Smoking raises your chances of getting lung cancer. We know this, right? Is every person who smokes going to get lung cancer? No. Are people who don't smoke going to get lung cancer? Yes. However, we know that there is a very close correlation, if not an actual causation, between smoking and lung cancer. So if I don't want lung cancer, I can't completely prevent myself from getting lung cancer because it could just happen. But I can lower my risk of getting lung cancer by not smoking and not being around smoke, right? It lowers my chances. I can't eliminate the chance completely, but I can do what I can to make it less likely that I'm going to get it. That's a really good way of looking at it because I see and I hear too many people, oh, well, skinny people do X, Y, Z, so why should I bother? I mean, people get hit by buses too. Why should I look both ways before crossing the street? Just step blindly out into the street. I mean, I do live in Philly and that is how people do it. But still, my point is, if you don't want to get hit by a car, the first thing you should probably do is look both ways before crossing the street. Is that going to stop some maniac from running you over when you're halfway across the road? No, but it lowers the chances of that happening. I just, anyway, this is a really good point. Good point, Momo. Anything necessary to prevent that from happening. And I take full responsibility for that. And I know how I got there. It's because I consumed a lot of fat acceptance influencer content that made me feel like I should be able to eat whatever I want regardless of what that's doing to my body. I was eating more sugar during my pregnancy than I have ever eaten in any point in my life. I'm not someone that likes sugar usually, but- Sugar, okay, look, everybody likes sugar because sugar's addictive. End of discussion. I got a sweet tooth when it comes to cakes and donuts, and I know that, so I don't keep them in the house. I know too many people, Alexandra Rodriguez, who use their pregnancies as an excuse to just gorge, to just eat whatever they want. Oh, I'm having a pregnancy craving. Oh, the baby's craving X, Y, Z. And sometimes it's really weird stuff. I, I, you know, if you're, if you're a woman and you have your period anyway, you're kind of familiar with really strange cravings during certain times of the month anyhow. I guess pregnancy just like dials that shit up. So you get these really weird pregnancy cravings that even when you tell people who aren't pregnant afterwards, they go, it doesn't, this sounds terrible, but I could see how that could work. You know, shit like pickles and ice cream, right? They even make pickle ice cream now. <laughs> I'm just saying. But I know during pregnancy, you get these crazy cravings. And I know some people who just don't have the willpower to say no to themselves, Alexandra Rodriguez, that they just go and they just binge on this stuff and they use their pregnancy as an excuse to do it, right? So just because you're having a craving, even during your pregnancy, if you know it's not something that's good for you, like if you're having a craving for like bacon maple donuts that have been deep fried and then have I don't know, whipped cream and chocolate sauce on top. I mean, it sounds delicious, but should you be eating that? No, no one should ever be eating that. It shouldn't exist. It probably does, but it shouldn't exist. And you should have enough knowledge in your brain to be like, okay, yeah, I'm craving that, but it's not good. It's not a good food, right? This is why I'm like, maybe, maybe some food should have morality. I don't know. I don't want to shame people, but at the same time, you, the individual, should understand that 
the value of a banana is not the same as the value of a Snickers bar. Like, I just, I just feel like that's something you should know. Should you eat the Snickers bar? I guess if you want to and you're willing to, you know, it doesn't bother you, go for it. But I mean, if you're trying to lose weight or you're trying to get healthy or you're trying to have a healthy pregnancy, should you eat the Snickers bar? Probably not. You should probably eat the banana instead. Anyway. During my pregnancy, I took that as a free pass to eat whatever I wanted. And I'm not saying necessarily that that's a bad thing. And you should be able to indulge whenever you're going through something like that. But I was doing it every single day and I was lying to my doctor about it because I was afraid that they would discriminate against me. Which is insane because had I been honest with them, they would have been able to give me the health care that I needed and that I deserved. But because I was too afraid, I was too brainwashed, I lied to them and it almost killed me and it almost killed my babies. My kids were delivered very early. They spent almost two months in the NICU. Choices that I made to make those choices by fat acceptance and fat liberation content creators. I don't know why her sound's cutting out. I imagine because she probably edited it edited it because she's clearly getting emotional it's fine um but she said um back this up a little bit because the uh she says her kids her baby spent almost two months in the NICU there uh, we go back it up oh. all because of the choices that I made and I was influenced to make by, and I was influenced to make those choices by fat acceptance and fat liberation content creators. Uh, and I, I have been working very hard to unlearn and deconstruct. I think it'll pick up from here. To unlearn and deconstruct from a lot of the rhetoric and ideology around fat acceptance and fat liberation recently. And I feel like this story I'm telling you is extremely important. Fat acceptance rhetoric is incredibly dangerous. I'm going to get extremely long. And, and then it starts over. So actually, uh, Hannah Alonso, I believe it is, has a really great series that's called Influencer Insanity. Now she hasn't touched on fat acceptance. Her focus is more on like, commodification and just objects and stuff and she does a lot of mlm things so but the reason i'm bringing it up though is her whole point with the influencer insanity series that she's doing is pointing out um how influencers in various parts of the internet can actually cause individuals to feel as if they are incomplete or lesser than because they don't own or purchase or partake in whatever it is the influencer is pushing right um like i'm not the coolest kid or i'm a loser because i'm not drinking starbucks or um all the cool kids have i don't know iphones ergo i should have an iphone or i'm not a cool kid that kind of a thing and on the surface you're like eh whatever I'm not influenced by anything. Yeah, but you are. So there's that. And you're influenced by the things that you bring into your own sphere, which is makes it even worse because now you feel like it's your decision, your that that it's completely and totally your decision, right? And so it sounds like that she built this this fat influence bubble around her, this fat acceptance bubble around her when she was young. It carried into her pregnancy. And because she had been internalizing all of this rhetoric, none of it was personally targeted right at her, but because she had created this bubble around herself, this was what she was interacting with. This is what she was internalizing. This is what she was thinking of when she went to the doctor. All doctors hate fat people. Therefore, I can't trust my doctor. Well, it almost killed you. So there you have it. Um, but that's kind of Hannah's point is that you you're being influenced even when you don't realize you're being influenced my point is you're bringing those influencers you're inviting them into your house basically and you don't realize 
how influential they are on you because you think you've made that decision on your own to bring them in. And therefore, they're not influencing you. You're just allowing them in your space. Once they're in your space, they start influencing you, right? That kind of a thing. And this is what you get. So her saying something like, I, I made poor decisions because I was influenced by fat acceptance creators and fat liberation creators. That's a pretty powerful statement about the power of influencers and creators, right? She does not seem to be an irrational person. She might be. I don't know. I don't know her personally. She may believe that there's giants underneath the pyramids in Egypt. I don't freaking know. But right now, she seems like she's a very down-to-earth, very logical thinking person. And she's capable of, as she says here, deconstructing fat acceptance to the point where she can look back on it and be like, I was being influenced in this moment. I may not have made these decisions. I would not have made the same decisions that I made back when I was 26 and pregnant with twins if I hadn't already been primed and influenced and internalized all of this fat acceptance BS that I truly believed, right? It's kind of like a deconversion story. Like you, everybody, a lot of people on my channel love the whole like leaving the Mormon church thing because there's, it's very easy to bash Mormons, I guess. I try not to do it, but it's a very popular topic on the internet is the whole like, I left the Mormon church. Scientology kind of gets the same crap too. We'll stop there. But the point is, you'll hear these deconversion stories of people leaving somewhat problematic religions, right? This is kind of the same thing. People want to say that fat acceptance is a cult. I don't, I don't think it's a cult. I think it's more like a religion. It's an identity, right? Religion tends to be identity driven. Fat acceptance is very much identity driven, right? And it's hard to leave a group when it becomes your social, when it becomes your social group, which is why people have a hard time leaving the church of their own volition because they are losing their social group, right? And, and, and in some instances, especially with religion, they're decoupling from their families and it's very difficult. Probably not a family problem here, but if she's been interacting with fat acceptance and fat liberation from before her 20s even, up until she was pregnant, she probably had a large friend group, if maybe only existing online, but she probably had a large social group online maybe in real life, that revolved around fat acceptance and, and fat liberation. She had to give that up, or she is currently giving that up and moving into a new phase of life without that. So that's why I'm saying, I don't think it's a cult. We can argue all you want about the Mormonisms. and No, we're not going to argue about Mormonism and Scientology. We're not going to do that. But I don't think fat acceptance is a cult. I think it's a religion. I think it could bona fide, bona fidely. I think it could definitely be classified as a religion. So it's, it's definitely a philosophy. So there's that. Anyway, uh, let's see what else she has to say. What? Else? Oh yeah. I wanted to watch this one. I don't know what's going on. Why can't I right click on these? All right, anyway. Oh, so this is a what I eat in a day. Uh, what I eat in a day is a fat person trying to lose weight, PCOS period edition. <laughs> uh, total 1971 calories today. I ate far less protein than my goal. Some days have been like this, especially when I'm coping with the first period of the first period I've had in eight months. Oh, she just had her kids. Dang. All right. She is very young. Uh, my lower back and lower abdomen feel like roadkill in the middle of a busy day, busy highway. Yeah, I'm... I challenged myself to do a weight workout today with the new weights I snagged at Aldi this weekend. Aldi, by the way, is a surprisingly good location to get cheap workout gear. Um, and I met my base goal of 6K steps. I'm looking forward to challenging myself more and more each day. And then just 
hashtags for that. I I just wanted to click on this because it said my Mormon ancestors said I needed to start the day with a soda, which if you know anything about Mormonism is completely wrong, which I just think is hilarious. All right, we'll, we'll do this. It's only 51 seconds long. We got the Dr. Pepper, zero sugar, corn casserole. That, no offense, that doesn't look good. But you know what? You eat what you like. Okay, look, her hair is being gorgeous, by the way. I am so jealous of her hair. Homemade mac and cheese. That sounds good. I might go make some mac and cheese. I have protein noodles because I can't have regular ones. Two eggs. A dog. Did you eat the dog? <clears throat> no, we're not doing that. Just two eggs. Um, homemade pizza, sourdough starter crust, homemade tomato sauce, and mozzarella cheese. I think it says not pictured. Bacon, olives, mushrooms. That sounds good. Uh, asterisk took a video of my dad's pizza because I forgot to film mine. In there. That looks good. I like a good homemade pizza. And then coffee chip ice cream. You know, you got to do what you got to do. Notice how I didn't eat the entire container. <laughs> very mindful, very demure. I, I'm not entirely sure who that person is who started that. I've seen clips of them, so I, I visually know who they are. But thank you. Thank you for starting that. Anyway. All right. Um, what else we got? Um, but this looks interesting. I haven't watched this one yet. It says, just something to think about. I believe in you. Hashtag food desert. Hashtag urban food desert. Hashtag obesity. Hashtag obesity is a disease. And there's some other ones, but I'm not clicking on it. Now, see, here we go. This is the only comment I'm going to read. Um, wait, sure. Overall health is going to be trash AF, though, if you don't have regular access to fruit and veg. And losing weight is real hard without those foods, too. Eye roll emoji. And Mo says, if you are in a caloric deficit, you'll lose weight regardless of what you eat. Getting a balanced diet is indirectly important to overall health. Yes. If you need to lose weight, especially if you're like, you know, like the 600 pound people, if you need to lose weight, you need to lose weight, period. End of discussion. You got to do the weight first. You got to lose the weight first. The getting a balanced diet is incredibly important. Getting a balanced diet is incredibly important to overall health. Yes. All right. But yeah, you can, there's actually one of the fat acceptance TikTokers. She hasn't lost a lot of weight, but she is losing weight eating garbage. All she eats is fast food stuff and it's, it's garbage food. She gets, um, yeah, cynical dude does the what I eat in a day videos and he covers her a lot she is a really very interesting personality he likes her a lot she is pretty funny actually but yeah her whole thing is that she's eating she's doing omad right now so she's eating one big meal a day and it's just garbage it's just fast food fast food fast food tacos mac and cheese um pasta what did she eat? Hamburgers, bacon and cheese, cheddar fries, that kind of stuff. And that's like all one meal. But it's the only meal she says she eats in a day. And she's been tracking her weight and she has been losing weight. She hasn't lost a lot, but she is losing weight. Anyway, so if there's no music on this, it's because I silenced it. But we're going to try it out. Never mind. She says, hang on, there's stuff here. Stop it. There's stuff to read. The second of my daily strolls through the urban food desert I work in. Did you know there are 6,500 food deserts in the United States? Yes, but by definition. The definition of what a food desert is, is very um, is, uh, broad. Broad is the word I'm looking for. Um, 6% of the U.S. population lives in a food desert. Yes. Did you know that obesity affects 46% of the adult population in the U.S.? I thought it was higher. I thought it was 52, but either way. That accounts for a 100 million people. 
Based on those numbers, 81 million or 40% of obese adults do not live in a food desert. Go back. I do not live in a food desert. If you believe the myth that everyone in a food desert is obese, which they are not. Since obesity and food deserts have such a small statistical overlap, isn't it silly to put such a heavy emphasis on food deserts in a conversation about obesity as a whole? As a whole, sorry. I'm talking to you, fat acceptance. We'll talk about this in a second, actually. She leaves that up for a good long time. I like that. The number one cause of obesity is energy imbalances. Calories in versus calories out. And anyone can do this regardless of income, ability, time, or availability. Managing your weight can be easy if you believe in yourself, treat yourself with kindness, and harness the power of patience and consistency. And have a really cute, cuddly, curly-haired dog that actually seems to like you, Anna. It, the song was Good Luck, Babe, Relate to Music. I'm over. So the food desert thing. Food desert is defined as in urban areas living uh not having some source of groceries basically within a mile a walking mile yeah and in the countryside it's 10 miles so which is not uncommon actually so the thing is, is that a food desert has especially in urban areas has a very broad definition so you you could, you could be living in a food desert. I technically live in a food desert because the nearest grocery store is just over a mile away from me. I don't know why I said walking mile. A mile's a mile. I don't, I don't know why I differentiated that. But anyway, my point is, uh, I do not have problems <laughs> at all getting access to food. And when I say the grocery store is just over a mile, it is literally just over a mile. So hypothetically, I could walk to and from the grocery store. It's not, it's not that big of a deal, right? But that's what I'm kind of pointing out is like, because the definition is so broad, I live in a food desert, but I don't, I don't really. Okay. So, but there are people, that being said, there are people who live in an area where they don't have access to a grocery store of any kind. They might have access to like a safe, not a safe way. Uh, what are those gas stations used to be called? Anyway, like a gas station. I wouldn't count that as like a grocery store. And I don't think it does count when it comes to food deserts, but I could be wrong. So they don't live close to these things. They don't have access to transit of some variety. So they're too far away to walk a reasonable distance, right? Um, they don't have access to like mass transit, a bike, a car, anything like that. So using transit to get to a grocery store that's further away than a mile or more uh, is not an option for them. Or they are in some way prevented from being able to get to the grocery store like, um, I don't know, like, like they can't. They don't walk or something like that. You know, that kind of a thing. Um, these are not issues I have. So these three things do kind of add up. And there's other factors as well. These being the major ones. It's There isn't one anywhere nearby. The one that is nearby requires some kind of transit. And you don't have that. You don't have access to that transit. And also, well, I mean, with today, you can order groceries and have them delivered to you. But a lot of times food deserts like this do correlate with lower income, which means you don't have the money to pay someone to bring you groceries because it isn't cheap, right? It's not cheap. Even if you're not tipping the guy, it's still not cheap to have your groceries delivered. You should always tip your driver. So those do exist. And people who are in those areas do suffer from what we would what people really think of when they think of a food desert, right? But when you understand how broad the term is, and then she says something to the effect of like, that affects 6% of the population, it takes that number, that 6%, and lowers it even more, which is why nobody addresses it. 
because it's such a small percentage of the population, it's very easy to go, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. And it also usually affects lower income areas, which is another reason why it's very easy to go, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. So when fat acceptance is talking about, uh, when fat acceptance and fat liberation and BOPO or whatever the fuck they want to call themselves today, when they're talking about food deserts, they're, they think they're talking about that kind of a, an area where there's no access to food and there's no easy way to get food in, right? Hi, the problem with when fat acceptance talks about it is they're using it as a shield, right? They aren't actually addressing the fact that there are food deserts and there are areas in the U.S. where people don't have reliable access to food. They're not talking about that. They're using it as a shield to justify why it's okay for them to eat junk food all the time. Come here. Oh, we're not playing this game. There we go. All right. We good? We good for now? You want in your chair? This baby does not have problems with food deserts. He just thinks he does. My cat. Is the perfect example of fat acceptance. He does not live in a food desert. He does not have problems getting access to food. He is well fed and well cared for. However, he would very much like to have treats right now. And he would very much like to have the rest of that can of wet cat food. Yes, he would, but he doesn't need it. All right. But he thinks he's oppressed because he can't have that can of cat food. Ah, uh, anyway. So yeah, so when we're talking about, when fat acceptance is talking about food deserts, they're really just using it as an excuse to justify their own behavior. They're not actually saying things like, hey, there's a food desert. What can we do as a community in order to get food to these people who might want to eat whole foods? No? They might want to eat fresh fruits and vegetables. They might enjoy frozen fruits and vegetables. You know, those are better than nothing. Actually, they're pretty good for you, honestly. I don't know why people villainize frozen foods. I also don't know why people go after canned foods. It's just like, stop it. <laughs> Quit being classist. But anyway, and that's, and that's the thing. Why she's going for fat acceptance over this and talking about the fat acceptance and the fat liberation people, especially on TikTok, the majority of them, I won't say all of them, but the majority of them, they don't have problems accessing food. They probably don't actually even live in a food desert. I think I made an argument there. I'm not entirely sure. Anyway, I know there's a bunch of cuts in here, mainly because there was a lot going on around me. My neighbor, uh, my neighbor, my apartments are testing the fire alarms while I'm trying to record. It's a personal thing. I know they're doing it just to piss me off. Anyway, it will make for kind of a choppy video. I want to stop here. I'm probably going to watch more of Momo's stuff, but I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I probably will watch more of Momo's stuff because it's interesting watching somebody come out of fat acceptance and I wish her luck. Also, I want to give her some support because the things that she are, she is saying are, are things that should be being supported by people who are anti fat acceptance. Like, I guess what I'm saying is, is I want to be a non TikTok ally to Momo because I'm not getting on TikTok um, and Momo's on the front line. So there you have it until she does something problematic or something like that. And then I'll reevaluate my statements. But, you know, we should be doing that for everybody. Anyway, I hope you guys liked it. If you've made it this far in the video, go ahead and leave a leave a little dog icon little dog emoji down in the comment section for whatever this dog's name is who's adorable we love you dog i don't know who you are but you're adorable and yeah so leave a your your emoji's a dog leave that down in the comment section uh let me know what you guys think do you follow momo have you seen other things with momo in it most of you have probably seen some kind of a reaction to uh her video calling out fat acceptance for privilege it is what's launching it is the idea that launched my videos that I'm working on, I promise. And yeah, let me know what you guys think. 
put a dog down there. Thank you to everybody who's been supporting the channel because I forgot to say this at the beginning. Uh, thank you to my subscribers. Thank you to my members. You guys rock. Thank you to everybody who's going to hit the thumbs up button. And that's pretty much it. See you guys in the next one. Bye. This is my outro music. You can't copyright strike me because it's just me singing. This is my outro music. Thank you for watching. See you next time.